Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Night Sky. You've made it to September the 22nd. Today is the autumnal equinox, and uh, that means that summer is officially over and we're embarking in fall and we're uh, uh, expecting cooler temperatures and, uh, and a new season upon us. Uh, we have an amazing program tonight. I'm really proud of, uh, of what we've been able to put together. Um, I'm just going to do the rundown for you real quick, and then I'll introduce some of the players that are with us tonight. So uh, uh, first, we're, I'm going to do a quick introduction to the program, um, and then we have uh, a guest from a, a, a Pan University program that ASU runs called Interplanetary Initiative. I won't say any more about it now, but that will be the first feature of our program to learn about what that is and learn how you as public can get involved with this very, very, very special project. Um, after that, we will be talking about the equinox and what that means and what is an equinox anyway and what's happening to the sun and the background stars and how that looks. We'll look at a little history. We're going to process ourselves back about 3,000 years to see what equinox looked like then. And we'll just explain how that works. If we've got a little time, we'll uh, walk you through a couple of constellations to look for in the night sky and some other things to look at. We've got uh, uh, some uh, features tonight, including resources for you to use offline and after the program. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but a bunch of citizens uh, just did a, an amazing space adventure. And so um, we'll kind of get you up to date on that. And then some uh, some words about future programs. And, uh, and that's how we'll fill our hour tonight. So welcome, everybody. We have a little bit bigger attendance than we normally do. Thank you very much if you've joined. So something about uh, how you heard about the program enticed you to come visit us tonight. And for those that are new, uh, welcome. We do this every other week and we have a lot of fun with this. And there's always, always something to learn from our program. There's always something to go out and look at and experience in the night sky. So that's really what, what our commitment is. Um, with me tonight is, uh, is Kim Baptista. She is the communications officer for our program. She's the one that communicates to you, gets these webinars set up, does all that technical work in the background, and she's absolutely invaluable to the program. Thank you, Kim. My colleague, Meg Hufford, is, is here as well. She is a staff member with us, and uh, she and I run outreach, outreach programs at the university. Uh, this particular virtual night sky program started during COVID when we couldn't have visitors to university and it has become a success in our minds and we're just gonna kind of keep doing it for a while if you guys don't mind. So please keep tuning in every other Wednesday and uh, uh, Meg and I will always put together a good program for you. I have two students here tonight. Uh, you have met them before, Alex Blanch and Alicia Hyatt um, and they are uh, uh, kind of eager to uh, help in the background. They will be handling some of the notifications at the end of the show and running question and answers and all that. That reminds me, so this is a webinar format. We do not do chat, but we do encourage you to uh, form questions or comments into the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. All you have to do is click that. If something, anytime during the program, if something comes to you, if you'd like to just sort of know something, uh, we're working those questions and doing responses in the background, and we're bringing several of the program uh, forward during the program, so you'll hear the live answers on the air as well. So that's the way to interact with us. So please take advantage of that. If something uh, sparks your interest, put it in the question and answer. Uh, we do run closed captioning, and you're in charge of what that looks like on your own screen. So if you uh, if you want. Uh, you can X out that button. You can put those closed captions on your screen if you like those. Uh, we do it because it makes it very much easier for us to uh, take these programs and put them on YouTube for, for people to watch later. Um, if you are a student or a teacher, uh, we'd like to hear from you outside of this program as well. So uh, teachers, we, we have a way to get into your classroom with virtual programming this semester. And we're launching that program. So if you are an educator, if you know an educator uh, in the K-12 program that would like to have programming into their, their things, please contact us. And you can do that uh, through uh, your webmaster or you can do that through the question and answer to say, I'd like to know more and we'll get back to you on that. So, so that's all the business end of it. And now I am really thrilled to introduce uh, Jessica Rousset. Uh, Jessica is the Deputy Director of Interplanetary Initiative. 
And in my experience in the Interplanetary Initiative is that it started a couple of years ago, and it was a brainchild of the president of the university, Dr. Crow, and our director at that time, Lindy Elkins Canton. And uh, so to learn more about it and what Interplanetary Initiative means and how you can participate, I'm going to introduce to you and welcome to the screen, uh, Jessica Rousset. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for coming tonight. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight on this first night of fall. And uh, my name is Jessica Rousset. I'm the Deputy Director at the Interplanetary Initiative at ASU. And um, I joined just six months ago, a little bit about myself. I'm a biochemical engineer by training, and I spent most of my career in healthcare and life sciences, primarily focused on bringing in innovative solutions to improve the health of children but I am now extremely excited to be part of this new endeavor, which I'll tell you all about tonight. I am going to share my screen and launch into some slides for you. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this well. Um, great, so here's the agenda that I uh, put together for you. I thought it would be really helpful to kick us off by sort of setting the table with um, going over the scope of the space enterprise at ASU. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how the interplanetary initiative got started, and then I will go do a little bit of a deep dive in some of the programs that we're uh, working on in the future of learning, as well as in, uh, in the research arena. And then hopefully we'll have a few, um, uh, a few minutes for some Q&A at the end. Okay, so I wanted to first sort of pause on ASU's charter if you're not familiar with it. Um, as someone who's new to the university, I feel that this charter is just really remarkable and really meaningful. And basically it states that we measure our success at ASU by who we include, not by who we exclude, and how they succeed, and, and really establishes a fundamental responsibility that we all have as ASU employees to, uh, to, to serve uh, our communities. And so at the Interplanetary Initiative, we really prioritize broad participation of diverse people in our programs. And I wanted to anchor everything else that I'm going to share with you today in sort of these important, uh, these very important and profound values. All right, so um, launching right in, um, this is a um, this is I, I think a really beautiful slide that sort of brings to life just how truly uh, broad and deep the space enterprise is at ASU. And I want to give a shout out to our colleagues at ASU New Space for researching this landscape and putting together uh, the slide because it really helps appreciate um, the number of space investigators that we have over 300 and sort of where they are across the university. We find a third in our School of Earth and Space Exploration, a third in our Fulton Schools of Engineering, and a third all in all other places across campus. Um, so this really brings to light just how highly interdisciplinary ASU space enterprise is. And just as um, sort of uh, extensive our internal uh, breadth is, uh, we have extensive relationships in space and science engineering outside the university with 120 private sector company uh, collaborations and projects, relationships with many universities, government agency centers and laboratories. Um, ASU has um, uh, the distinction of being also the only university on the executive board of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And this is also um, um, by way of the great work of our colleagues at ASU New Space. And um, this industry group is, uh, is very important. It establishes uh, ever higher level, levels of safety for commercial human space flight. Um, they share best practices and expertise and really serve to promote the growth of the industry worldwide. So this is a very important relationship and role that ASU has uh, with this group. ASU is also active in 25 missions. Um, there's deep uh, knowledge and strength at ASU in planetary science, astronomical sciences, and instrumentation. And looking at this list, in maroon, uh, sorry, let's start in black. In black, you see the, uh, uh, the missions in which ASU is the hardware lead for one or more instruments. 
And then in Maroon, those missions where we have a science team member. And then over to the left, um, I wanna draw your attention to those four missions there where we are leading from the top. And I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the Psyche mission in particular for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's a very interesting and remarkable mission. And secondly, because the principal investigator uh, of this mission is uh, Dr. Lindy Elkins Tanton. Uh, she is also the co-founder and managing director of the Interplanetary Initiative. Uh, but first to speak a little bit of this mission, um, she's leading a team that's building the spacecraft that you see here on the slide with its large solar arrays. And this craft is gonna go take a close look at the asteroid Psyche uh, that's about 1.5 billion miles away in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, scientists know very little about this asteroid and it appears as really a tiny dot in telescopes, but they do believe it to be primarily made of metal. And as we get closer and we analyze its composition with all the instruments that are on board, uh, we'll get a better understanding of the origins of rocky planets like the Earth and uh, more generally uh, the origins of our solar system. So this um, mission is uh, launching in August of 2022 and it will take about three and a half years to reach um, to reach Psyche and start um, sending data back to us. Uh, so this is a very exciting uh, project and mission uh, that Lindy is involved with. And, um, uh, but now I would like to sort of segue over to the Interplanetary Initiative. And I wanna start by just telling you the story of how it began. And so uh, the concept, um, as Rick sort of mentioned uh, as well in his introductory remarks, uh, started off as a conversation between our president, Dr. Michael Crow, who you see here on the right of the slide, and uh, Lindy Elkin-Stanton, who you see here on the left, back in 2016, when they asked, how can we pioneer new ways of combining research and education in teams pursuing the big questions? And of course, at the time, Lindy was the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And so it, it sort of unfolds naturally that to use space exploration as this compelling and freeing vehicle for ideation about the future of society and education. And so it's with this framing, um, finding common cause in an essential challenge for humanity, our space future, that this new challenge was posed to transform both how we educate the, new gen the next generation and how we fundamentally conduct research. And so fast forward to 2017, um, Lindy developed a clear vision for how she could effectively bring disciplines together in new ways to advance and prepare us for the challenges and opportunities of becoming interplanetary. And the initiative was born as a pan university effort to make connections internally uh, and to reach outside the university to reimagine research and education. And in 2017, uh, 2017 was also the year that the Psyche mission that she had proposed at the time was selected for flight by NASA. So an eventful year. So what we envision is an interplanetary future that's built upon cooperative and inclusive new structures, systems, and perspectives. We're uh, trying to uh, prepare humanity to become interplanetary, certainly by building on all the uh, strengths that we have at ASU in planetary science and robotics, but more importantly for the initiative, by bringing in all the disciplines that are not yet involved in creating our interplanetary future. So I invite you to imagine the landscape to becoming interplanetary as this great big bare lunar landscape with on the one side, the aerospace and defense industrial complex, with its various space agencies, its traditional aerospace companies, its new space companies, just the huge human spaceflight infrastructure that supports all the amazing work that we hear about um, in the news a lot these days. And then on the other side, the visionary science fiction writers and futurists. And by and large, in the, in the middle, there's nothing. And so the Interplanetary Initiative seeks to populate this landscape with the historians and the artists and sociologists, and educators, entrepreneurs and writers, of course, scientists and psychologists, um, all trying to connect these disciplines together to create a better interplanetary future. And so how do we think about 
um, achieving this ambitious vision? Well, our approach is to deploy new ways of building teams and solving problems at scale, partnered across disciplines, sectors, and cultures to shape that inclusive and sustainable interplanetary future. And we organize ourselves along these two pillars for affecting a positive interplanetary future. The first one, we in the first one, we ask ourselves, how do we empower individuals, all of us here tonight, how do we empower ourselves to see ourselves as inter, interplanetary, to take an active part in creating the space future that we all want? And in this, in this book, this pillar, we really spend a lot of time designing, implementing and scaling new ways of educating as many people as possible. And then on the um, other side, we ask the question, how can we ensure broad societal participation and consideration in creating the structures and the systems that will shape humans' future in space? And, um, and here we focus on ways to engage broader swaths of people into the research process while targeting big goals and, uh, and making progress faster. So I'm gonna start by sharing with you some of the work we're doing on the experimental learning side and with um, our first program, which is our technological leadership degree. We launched this last year. It's a bachelor's degree that is um, very different. Uh, this degree offers research experience to undergraduates in the classroom by teaching the process of scientific inquiry. So, this is not based on a conventional lecture recitation type teaching model, of course, because that's not the world that we learn in. We are submerged with information. We need to know how to navigate it and to become master learners. And we should start that process at the undergraduate level. So our students learn one, to ask their own questions, to identify unsolved problems to go after, and then to research vet their own, their own information, synthesize that information, and then communicate it back to their team members. And these are really all the essential skills that one needs in life. So the degree is designed to be completed in three years, and it combines uh, thinking courses that are entirely student-led in the classroom. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how these run. Uh, they are combined with making courses that are hands-on, um, and then various foundational courses that you see here, but that also, of course, include the STEM uh, uh, subjects, but also strategic thinking and leadership and psychology. And then we uh, also require two summer internships. This program is offered online as well as on campus, and it's perfect for students that are seeking a STEM degree that uh, offers a hands-on and active learning experience um, and leading to careers that span management consulting, uh, project, product and program management, tech transfer and commercialization, um, as well as entrepreneurship to name a few. So I wanna dive a little bit more into these thinking courses because they use uh, a unique approach um, that are these inquiry cycles. So the students um, tackle a broad topic that's interdisciplinary on which they're given a little bit of information on the first day. Of course, at the uh, Interplanetary Initiative, a lot of our faculty are uh, interested in space exploration. So a lot of times these big questions um, relate to that. For example, you know, what would the Earth look like if life had never arisen? So those are kinds of big questions that we pose our students, but they could be any question. Um, so we give them a little bit of information on that first day. And then we sort of spark their curiosity by asking them, well, what is the natural question that uh, you would like to ask next? So the question asking skill that we develop through these cycles is really what you need to be an effective researcher. And it's not generally rewarded in classic undergraduate education. So then as a team, um, these natural next questions as we call them are, are shared and they're voted upon. And then the highest ranking question is chosen. And the students then go and find, do their own research. They go find a, uh, some, a peer reviewed paper that will, address at least in part um, some of the question and then report back to the team. And they go through the cycle several times during the semester to get closer to answering the big goal question. But importantly, um, it's important to highlight that um, no one is an expert. No one knows the answers to these big questions. It can take a lifetime to answer these big questions. And so everybody comes to the process bringing something of their own, something unique. The students learn to listen to each other, to give each other 
feedback and uh, everybody learns, including the instructors. And so that makes open inquiry not only effective, but also a really a fun process. Um, this degree is taught by top faculty across uh, ASU. Uh, the degree is not does not belong to a specific department at ASU. It's a pan university degree, just as uh, you know, the initiative is a pan university initiative with contributions from 15 units and counting. And so on the heels of the success of our technological leadership um, uh, degree program, we're now taking this open inquiry pedagogy to the community with a new program called Open Citizen that is a collaboration between the Interplanetary Initiative and the Learning Enterprise at ASU, as well as an education technology startup called Eagle Learning. And you might ask, well, you know, why are we uh, going beyond the, the bounds of ASU? Well, because 3% of people across the globe enter an educational program beyond high school, let alone graduate. And as we sort of, I, I, I touched on earlier, this is an age of information, misinformation, disinformation. And so learning how to parse content, learning how to learn, learning how to solve problems is becoming just more important than ever. And so Open Citizen, it offers a framework. It offers a scaffolding to teach people how to learn and how to solve problems and ultimately to, to thrive in today's ever-changing world. You can be an individual, you can um, work as a team, you can work on a personal, tackle a personal goal, a community a problem, any project that really is meaningful in one's life, and, um, and then earn college credits for workforce critical skills that are gained as you go through this process. To date, over 500 individuals across California, New York, Kansas, and Arizona are using the Open Citizen Program and democratizing this process for problem solving. If this piques your interest and you'd like to learn more and even experience it, uh, we invite you to um, apply for our Open Citizen Gathering. Uh, it's happening November 12th through the 14th at Arco Santi, which is an artist uh, retreat in uh, the high desert here in Arizona. Um, and during this event, participants will experience a highly collaborative series of sessions that are designed to introduce open inquiry processes, as well as learner-centered pedagogies, and importantly, to give participants strategies for going from the inquiry process to action and, and improving your life. So we're very excited about this uh, program and, um, and would love to tell you more about it if you're interested in joining us. So now I'm going to um, shift over to talk a little bit about how we're innovating in research. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about our big questions teaming process. So similarly to how we're shifting the power dynamic in the classroom, giving students the reins to guide their own research and their own learning, uh, we shift the process of launching new research projects from one expert uh, coming up with a really cool question that can be solved with that person's knowledge and their tool belt to having experts across many disciplines come together to tackle a big question. So this process really starts with the big questions, as you can see on this um, uh, on the slide here, and really far down the process is a leader selected. And this process has proven to be an extremely effective way to overcome incremental thinking and to accelerate research outcomes but don't necessarily take my word for it. I invite you to come and experience it for yourselves. Um, we do these big question teaming workshops once a year. And fortunately it's happening this week uh, in uh, this Friday, September 24th on our Tempe campus from 10 to 12. Um, and uh, we, everyone is invited. So if you're interested in experiencing this for yourself, please come and join us. Uh, for this event. And this is how we launch our research projects and how we seed fund projects. So we have a pilot project uh, program. You can see here just little uh, thumbnails of the different projects that we funded over the year. There are 26 of them. Um, and they've all resulted from this big question process. Um, please learn about them on our website, um, uh, but I want to take a little time just to highlight two of them to bring this to life for you. 
The first project um, I want to share with you is Port of Mars. This team um, chose to tackle the following big question. How can we best sustain healthy communities in space? And so they proposed a social studies game for uh, navigating dilemmas of shared resources, common good, and collective action under conditions of high uncertainty and high risk like you would find in space. So in this game, the players are citizens of an early Martian community and they're charged with working together uh, to provide the sustained welfare of the settlements. And the uh, player's actions are tracked, they're analyzed, and they can tell us something about the behaviors that tend to produce success and those behaviors that tend to produce failure. This started as a card game, it evolved as a video game. If you are an ASU student, uh, there was an opportunity to play this game. There are several times a year through the Mars Madness uh, tournaments. And so uh, lastly, just what I'll say on this slide is I want to uh, draw your attention to the team. So uh, these are all the disciplines that are represented uh, through the, the team members that have made this project um, happen. And you can just see how uh, reflective of that, that breadth uh, it is in the process. The other project I wanted to share with you is Mission Interplanetary. Um, this team uh, took aim at this big question, how can we effectively explore and share the exciting challenges of designing positive space futures? And what they proposed was a podcast. So Mission Interplanetary uh, wrapped up a first season uh, in partnership with Slate. And um, we invite you to download the podcast and listen to uh, the, the, um, the episodes. They're amazing uh, hosts and also incredible guests across uh, different sectors and disciplines tackling um, very interested and diverse, interesting and diverse topics. So please check it out and let us know what you think. Um, and we do a lot of, um, we have a lot of public events. Um, this is, uh, just a recap of our activities last year, we reached um, over 10,000 people in our various programming from public webinars um, to, of course, our, uh, you see here, our podcast and our Mars Madness tournament. And we're certainly hoping that um, as COVID evolves, we can do more in-person events and see you all there. But um, the best way to get involved with our public events is to sign up for our uh, newsletter, uh, which I invite you to do. And um, lastly, um, uh, I want to talk about our interplanetary lab. Uh, this is a beautiful space uh, on our Tempe campus. It, um, it takes a maker space approach to solving society's urgent space challenges with full life cycle space flight hardware and software development. So the lab uh, provides access to specialized equipment and expertise and to enable groups to pursue projects that are either too risky to invest in themselves or um, otherwise out of reach due to limited resources. And we offer services and access to external partners as well. Uh, so we work with universe other universities and industry. So if you'd like to learn more about the capabilities, come take a tour. Um, the team would be uh, more than happy to host. And so um, with that, I, I just want to sort of conclude by saying that uh, we are eager to engage. Uh, we want uh, broad participation in what we're doing. There are a lot of different ways of getting involved with the Interplanetary Initiative to start creating our interplanetary future together today. And I just want to highlight a few here. Um, we are always interested in pairing up our technological leadership students with really good internships. If you are an educator and you're uh, interested in using open inquiry uh, in your programs. We do offer workshops and we'd be very interested in speaking with you. Our applications are open for the gathering. If you'd like to join us, uh, please reach out. Um, and again, our interplanetary lab um, is always open for visitors and for, and for tours. And then just lastly, a last shout out for our big questions teaming workshop that is happening this Friday. Uh, and we hope you sign up and uh, join us for our many public events. So um, with this last slide, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight and for the opportunity to, to join you all. And I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Jessica, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll uh, ask in the background, are there any questions you want to bring um, that the team wants to bring forward? And I have a couple of questions for you too, just in case they don't. 
So uh, let me let me ask you this: so the program, if I were, I was sort of in some of the initial meetings and things like that, and I remember when it launched, uh, it was it was kind of loose, and it was really sort of like lots of different moving pieces. All these people were excited to get involved, and I think you've been able to sustain that involvement. But but tell me, where does this go? What's this look like five years from now or ten years from now? You know, you said, I think you said you had 10,000 people participating yeah. in programs this year. What's that look like in the future? How do we get there? Yes. So um, that's a very interesting question um, and timely as we look at, you know, how we want to grow our efforts. Um, I think, you know, what we want is to bring people together, right, across sectors and across uh, disciplines. So um, what we're doing with our programs, we'd like to scale them and replicate them, right? And work with other universities and corporations and bring these methodologies that we're proving and sort of testing out at ASU and adapting them so that more people can benefit from them. And so we're really interested in partnering so we can scale our processes um, and enable others to experiment with them and co-create with, with other partners to improve on them. Um, and so for us, it's more people using exploration, you know, learning and open inquiry in different ways, improving on it, gathering data, um, doing open, open uh, the open citizen program um, across many industries. There are so many use cases for it. Um, and, um, and certainly uh, having, you know, uh, broad partnerships with other universities as we think about space exploration and creating the infrastructure needed for more people to have access. Uh, we're very interested in uh, focusing on 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 access um, and, and broad participation and ways to do that. I, I remember, I think, um, uh, some of the early interest in energy uh, comes from the theater department, which is, you know, I mean, typically we used to say, you know, space people talk about space and scientists talk about sort of, you know, technologists talk about what we're going to do up there. But this is really not that at all, is it? I mean, this is really, well, when you say transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, all of these different viewpoints and everything is, is brought to the table. So when we were discussing this a couple of days ago, the idea that uh, citizens can get involved, and I really look forward to that program in November, uh, because that's the point. You don't have to be afraid to get involved. You don't have to know anything about propulsion systems or guidance systems. This isn't about that. This is about becoming a space culture and, and how that works with the uh, society, right? Yes, we um, will become interplanetary. It is happening. We all have a stake in it. And so we all need to uh, find ways to be involved in the conversation, be educated and be empowered to drive what that future looks like across all the disciplines and, and sectors. Yeah. Great. Let me ask Alex and Alicia if they have a question to bring to the table. This is in the chat. Yeah, we actually have a few. I think, do we just want to do uh, one or two of them right now? Yeah, let's do a question and then let's launch that poll thing. Okay. I think we actually want to get the audience involved in the poll actually after hearing the talk. So the first one comes from David and they asked, would a student be able to minor in technological leadership or is it only a primary degree plan? We're working towards uh, creating and offering a minor. So not yet, but we are working on it. Okay. I can see how that would be a real interest to a lot of different disciplines. Again, right? you could be a business major, right. but you'd absolutely want to minor in something like this. That would be okay. absolutely super. Alicia, do you have a question? Uh, not a question, but I was going to launch. Oh, yeah, go on. ahead. Yep, yep, please do. So, so yep, we sort of, uh, so now that you get, everybody's heard this thing, so we're going to give you some uh, some ways that you can think about how you might get involved. So. Right. So, yes, I do have a question for you. I have a poll question, and that is, what interplanetary programs interest you? So go ahead and cast your votes below in the polling, and uh, I think we might have another audience question that we can take while we're doing this and, poll. And I, I might add to the poll is you might like more than one of these, but just kind of do the one. Is sort of if you were going to jump in, at what area would you engage if you sort of like uh, felt like jumping into the program? Um, and then go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So another question comes from Donna. Uh, do you anticipate technology transfer from the various projects, uh, e.g., to solve ongoing issues on home planet Earth? 
Um, so, sorry, Alex, can you, can you repeat that? Is the, the question, if you could repeat it. Yeah, so I, I think they're talking about uh, mm -hmm. transfers in technology from space and that sector mm -hmm. to going to okay. solving issues here on Earth in a more yeah. Yes, yes. Um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, folks that, that are um, um, knowledgeable about the space industry recognize how beneficial it is to our life on Earth and how, you know, uh, transformational um, it has been. Um, a lot of what we focus on as part of our um, target outcomes and how we select projects is to always look at the, the benefit here on Earth. Um, so that is a filter by which we look at the possible, all the many things that we might do. Um, it's, it's critical. It, it, you know, for, for, for folks to feel interplanetary and to get a sense of that, there needs to be a connection to our daily lives. Um, so I think that is um, an, essential, an essential consideration. And this this clearly does it. If I you know from the participating in, in the projects and talks that I've been in, it really is all about. It's about us. It's about society, and um, it's not about this sort of high end technology being done by others. And so so I think that's great. Uh, any other questions? So we go. We go. Uh, well, Alex is looking perhaps. Uh, oh yeah, you can the poll. So thank you so much. Uh, there's interest all across the board, but we have an overwhelming interest in public webinars and events at 52%. So thank you so much for providing that feedback in the poll. And perhaps Alex has our last question of our Q&A. Yeah, I think so there's, there's also something for everybody in the poll. I like the place. There's people are ready to jump into the, to the learning as well. So that's really super cool. Big questions, yeah. good. So we'll take um, one last question from Camille, who says, what is the difference between scientific exploration in space, which seems realistic, and colonization of space, which seems unrealistic? Um, the difference between space exploration and space colonization, which is uh, certainly colonization is, I think, a term that folks are not necessarily comfortable with. Um, so I guess meaning, um, humans living, uh, living in space. Um, people, a lot of people are working hard and putting a lot of uh, investment in making that happen. So I, I would sort of uh, challenge that I think it's, uh, it, it, it is realistic and it will happen. And we need to, we need those historians. We need, you know, we need all those perspectives that can teach us how to do it in uh, the most mindful way possible. So I think, um, in, in this realm, um, having all the perspectives and the disciplines to the, at the table to be, to be thoughtful about how we go about this, uh, um, you know, these, these bold new dimensions um, is going to be actually quite critical. I, I remember uh, just not that long ago, uh, the question came up about whether you would you be willing to be a person to go to Mars if you knew yeah. that you couldn't come back. Remember that? And this, was, this, this was a big question about two, three years ago. And I had an opportunity to ask college level classrooms that question. You know, like, you know, here's a group of 160 students that are, you know, young and, and honest. And uh, the number of people that just said, yep, yeah, I'm ready to go. I want to do it. I would be, I would be on that first flight. I would do that. Um, I think that's really kind of, kind of interesting uh, that people are, I, you know, it's not some, wild idea anymore yeah. i think it's it's not, it's not if uh it's it's kind of it's when, it's when. i think it's is, when we're going to do that so excellent yeah. well yeah. jessica thank you very much I just, i've been waiting for this opportunity to just have this a good thorough this is a, a, a really big program and there's lots of pieces to this and so i don't want it to scare people away uh, from the poll, I can see that you everybody sort of has found a place, you know, maybe they can get involved this way or that way or that kind of thing. And so, so I think that's going to be good. And I hope we see a sort of a boost of interest in the program. Yeah. And good luck with it. And then uh, remind me just what's happening on Friday. Again, just one more time. Yeah, so Friday, uh, there are big questions teaming workshop from 10 a.m. to noon uh, on our Tempe campus. Um, I believe uh, Taryn probably added a link to register. Yeah. Yeah. And so open to the public, You, everyone is welcome. And I can see that there's 19 people that are gonna go. I can see it from the poll. Excellent, good. And then the citizen uh, uh, workshop that happens in November to look forward to as well. Correct, yeah. Oh, super cool, thank you very, very much.
Hey, I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit, and uh, I think Jessica's going to hang around. So if a lingering question comes up, or we want to chat again at the end of the, end of the program, um, uh, Jessica will be here, and I appreciate your, your participation. Uh, hey, I, I actually, if you were here two weeks ago, I gave you very, very specific instructions about what to watch, what the moon was going to do uh, from two weeks ago, and how it was going to move through the sky and visit things. So now's my chance. I'm going to do another poll question here. Um, now's my chance to see if you did your homework. I want to know how many people might have done this. So, Let's see, so the question is, did you follow the moon as it passed over Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter? Not very many people. Oh, there's another question in there. Um, so I, far, the majority have chosen the correct answer, choice one. Okay, <laughs> okay good. That's I'm good. Be good. Because good, that. because I'm gonna uh, give you another I'll show you some things to look at uh, before we meet again. Uh, so I'm going to share screen real quick. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the equinox and what that means. And so I'm going to kind of start with this idea. I'll bet this has happened to you. And I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago um, that somebody in your family or somebody you know in the last week or so said, gosh, I think it's uh, getting darker earlier. Or I think I could feel a change in the weather or uh, something is changing and maybe you can't quite put your fingers on it, uh, but there's something going on astronomically that really makes us aware, makes us sort of think about the end of summer in particular uh, uh, with, some, uh, um, with some, some hope for a future of uh, better temperatures and better weather and more opportunities to go outside. I'm just going to share a screen here real quick. And uh, oops, I better add some stuff to the screen here. I just want to kind of... Uh, I'm going to put a little panorama. This is uh, across the street from my house. And you can see the sun is there. I'm cheating a little bit because I'm leaving a night sky up, but uh, the sun is kind of in the sky. And then I'm also going to add a little thing that sort of shows us uh, essentially where West is. And this little simulation I have on the screen here is where the sun went behind the house across my street. That's Marcine's house. She's my neighbor. And uh, that's where it uh, de descended to be on her house uh, tonight. Uh, uh, and I uh, just wanted to show you something here real quick. Let's do this. I'm going to kind of move forward uh, or backward, actually. So when we last met, Two weeks ago, you guys were at a virtual night sky, and that night, the sun set across my street over there, not in the west, but there. Now watch this. I'm just going to kind of like move it forward 14 days, and you can see every single night, each one of those little iterations was the next night. In fact, the sun is moving fairly quickly across that horizon. Uh, kind of coming from the north, heading towards the south. And you saw how much territory it covered across the horizon in just two weeks. Uh, let me go forward a little bit. So we're going to meet again two weeks from now on October the 6th. We've got a great program put together for you. And let's just see what the sun's going to do over the next couple of weeks. There it goes. So you see what's going on here, of course, is the sun is changing its position related to the horizon. Uh, again, uh, the summer solstice was now three months ago, the middle of June, and it had its uh, set in the, the furthest north. And then it started trekking its way south, uh, crossing that sort of that, that, that point in, uh, uh, at the western sky tonight. And so that's what it looks like from my house. That's what I'm seeing. But there's some other things you're noticing. You live in Phoenix. So you're, if you're a commuter, uh, you know that our street system is grids. Many of our major thoroughfares go exactly east-west. And so if you're on your way to work in the morning or you're on your way home from work in the afternoon, you see that this funny time of the year, this time in September and then also another time in March, that sun really gets in your way. The glare from the sun just right, it sets right on top of the boulevard as you're sort of driving home or driving to work in the morning. And that only happens for a very short period of time. The sun actually moves if you want, in this particular month I just described there, moving from uh, two weeks ago to two weeks in the future, uh, uh, it actually changes its set time by about 40 minutes. And so it moves, I guess the point here is that it changes faster this time of year, uh, right at the equinoxes, than it does during the solstices or during any other time of year. 
So if you've noticed the change, if something has happened to make you like you wake up in the morning, your alarm goes off and two weeks ago, it was dark or light outside and now it's dark outside. Uh, that's because this transition is happening. So let me kind of just, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit and uh, I'm gonna get rid of this particular scene because we don't need uh, Marcin's house anymore. I'm going to spin us around so that we're actually now uh, kind of looking towards the south. <clears throat> and I will sort of just move forward uh, just a little bit. That wasn't forward this way, just a little bit. Let me turn on uh, some constellation boundaries. There we go. Let me give you some sort of labels of the constellations. I'm going to come up. Oops, I don't know how to do this. I've got a little setup here. I'm going to do. Um, and uh, in one more second, I just have to give myself a little bit more adjustment here. Um, I'm going to add some lines to the screen, and I think we've talked about these before, but this blue line kind of moving across the screen right here is what we call the line of the ecliptic. Uh, that is actually sort of tracing out the movement of the sun uh, against the background of stars in the sky. And what does all that mean? That means that sort of this, this, as the sun moves, I'll move forward just a little bit further so you can see that. Uh, it is actually set up at uh, yesterday, I'll move it to today. Uh, so you can see right here, the sun is actually in uh, the constellation of Virgo. Uh, each one of these little blue tick marks marks the path of the sun through the sky. So every day, just relentlessly, the sun is going to move one of these little tick, uh, tick marks. You can see in about eight, 10 days, it's going to cross into October and then into November. And, uh, and that's how that works. Now, I'm also going to add another line to our, uh, our scene here. Uh, this is the Earth's equator projected out into space. And so you can see very clearly here, actually, I'm going to just kind of move over a little bit further. So it's a little bit clearer in the sky. So you can see here, uh, this is the big dealie. The sun has over the last several days sort of like been moving down. Today, it crosses the equator. It crosses the plane of the equator in space and will start moving uh, below the equator. So um, you kind of get it. When it's above the equator, it's our summertime. When it's below the equator, it's our winter time. And when it's right in the middle, what, that's the time of year, or that's the time that we have equal light day and night. And so 12 hour day, 12 hour night, and that's what we can expect when it crosses that line and that's what's happening today. It hasn't always crossed here. This is actually something new. So there is a thing going on in space. It's the wobble of the Earth, right? The Earth is tilted uh, 23 and a half degrees. So the line of the ecliptic, this blue line represents the plane of the solar system. The green line represents the plane that is described by our Earth's equator, and the Earth is tilted a little bit. So those lines don't match up. They're inclined to each other. And so what we're observing again is the sun moving from the north to the south. But this constellation over here, you can sort of see the word over there, is the constellation of Libra. When the sort of uh, the zodiac was organized when uh, early astronomers, philosopher, scientist, astronomers in Greek uh, times sort of got our zodiac position. It was twelve constellations that were all of, of, uh, that followed this line. So the sun moved through a parade of constellations, twelve of them. There are twelve months, and you can sort of see how this would tick by as the sun moves along. It will move into the realm of another constellation as it moves. Uh, at that time, uh, the equinox happened uh, when the sun passed from Virgo into Libra. Libra, remember the scales, is that sort of balance, that weight between two different things. And in their particular interpretation, Libra, the scales, was that equal day and night. Well, this act of precession, which is caused by that wobble, is a 25,800 year cycle, almost 26,000 years 
but to go all the way around. And over the past ensuing um, uh, 3,000 years, I'm going to go back actually to the year uh, 979 BC, if that's all right with you guys. Um, and let's just sort of see what happens. See where those lines cross? The line of the ecliptic and the equator. So 900 years before the current era, uh, the sun passed that, crossed that equator while it was entering the constellation of Libra. And then, of course, it would move through and move through and move through and all that stuff. So we have backed up essentially 20 degrees in, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in circumference along the ecliptic. And so that's really when you hear about precession and we hear about some uh, archeologists like to study this and like to interpret uh, the, uh, the building of buildings and how they're oriented to the sky and all that stuff. And if you're talking about ancient Egypt and Babylonia and Assyria, you really have to take into account the fact that, uh, that this particular movement happened and the sun doesn't follow the same path monthly now as it did uh, 3,000 years ago. So it's important to us now because things are changing fast. The, uh, the temperature's changing. Uh, I know in the morning I get up really, really early and walk the dog and there's a little bit of a chill in the air finally. And over the next uh, several weeks, it's going to change more and more and more. And this is all happening because of this. Ancient people are aware of this and, uh, and, and uh, um, it's uh, kind of just been, been part of, uh, of, of our, our life and our history and our understanding of the night sky uh, ever since. And so let me just kind of like move it backwards again. Oops, I've just gone um, minus. Hang on a second. I'm going to go forward a little bit so we can get back there. So um, now just to make sure you understand that when the sun crosses the equator today, uh, it's just barely into the constellation of Virgo. And uh, the way it worked about 3,000 years ago, it was in the constellation of Libra. I'm going to uh, stop share on this screen. I wanted to share another screen and just show you a little bit more, more to look at. And if you have any questions about this, this is a really great time to kind of put them into the question and answer period so you can see that. Um, this is just a little bit clumsy because I haven't figured out to share this very gracefully. I'm going to kind of open up now and uh, do a little program for you. There it is. I think those of you who have been watching this program over time know that I really like this program. I kind of promote it. It's one we use uh, for teaching purposes in labs and whatnot um, uh, in the university. And uh, I, it's called Sky Safari Pro. And what I like about it is that I can just kind of show you your night sky on the fly as we do this here. So um, uh, everything within the uh, blue circle in the middle is above the horizon tonight. Uh, this is set up for 7.30, so I guess it's about 20 minutes ago. That's not gonna make that much difference. What I'm gonna invite you to do is your homework assignment for this next coming week is to go out about seven o'clock would be good. The sun is setting earlier, right? We just talked about all that. Uh, go out in the night sky, and I'm gonna just have you focus towards the south this time. Um, everything, the really cool stuff, the cool activity that's going on right now uh, is kind of organized towards the south. You can see that there's a line of planets there. Um, let me do a little screenshot so I can draw, I can draw on the screen. And so that line of the ecliptic, remember I was kind of showing you on the other screen? It's a little wobbly right here, but it kind of connects all the planets together. You can see Mercury is down here. Uh, Venus is up in the sky. Um, Saturn and Jupiter are visible. Neptune, you can't see without a telescope. And Pluto, you can't see without a really, really big telescope. But all of those are there. So at 7 o'clock tomorrow night, if you're looking towards the south, uh, over there on your right, at fairly high above the horizon, is going to be the very bright Venus. And over there on your left, uh, uh, equally above the horizon, uh, on the other side of the south, sort of towards the southeast, is going to be the very bright planet Jupiter. If you kind of back up between the two just a little bit, um, that's where you're going to find Saturn. Two weeks from now, we're going to focus on Jupiter. 
And so the program is going to include a discussion of mission, a mission to one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. But I'm also going to show you how to see the Galilean moons of Jupiter. And we're going to try to show you different views of that, how to get those views, how to look at um, uh, those, those moons and what they mean. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about them scientifically. We're going to talk about a little bit about how to find them and what they do. And then there's a rich history of understanding the movement of those planets that dates all the way back to 1609 and 1610. Uh, to the days of Galileo in the night sky. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you, I'm just going to do delete this screenshot, show you one more thing, and then I'm going to ask the students to come back with a little bit of a program here. Now, there are two constellations that are just fun to go identify in the sky. One of them is Scorpio. And you can see we're not very far above the horizon here. Uh, this is directly south. Uh, this is about 730. And what I can do sort of is describe for you just a little bit here, um, a uh, scorpion. <clears throat> it's a scorpio. It's one of those stars of the zodiac. Um, it is really easy to find and really easy to identify as a scorpion. It's one of those constellations that just looks like what it is. Uh, the lead star right here, this reddish star, is called Antares, and it sort of relates to a star that looks like Mars but is not Mars. So if we figure out that Antares, that's where that name comes from. Um, this is Libra. Remember, I said uh, the, um, um, that the, um, uh, and here's your scales right here, like coming down the sky. Um, and the naming of the stars in Libra, Libra actually refer to these claws. So this one is known as the Northern Claw. This one is known as the Southern Claw. Um, but Libra is that thing. Remember now the sun is way back over this way. Back in the day at equinox, the sun would have been obscuring Libra and you wouldn't have been able to see it this time of year. And then lastly, I want everybody to try to find these little teapots. There's a little sort of uh, asterism here. Um, it's part of Sagittarius. Sagittarius is actually an archer. And uh, you can sort of see he's got an arrow going this way. And the constellation sort of trails down in this particular direction. The teapot is pretty easy to find, pretty easy to identify. And this really is the best time of year to do it. So go out after seven o'clock. So what's your homework tonight, or this, this coming week? Uh, go out the next couple of days, make sure it's a nice clear night, look towards the south. You're going to find those planets. They're all going to be lined up. Venus on one side, Jupiter on the other side. Uh, Saturn just kind of like next to Jupiter, back them up a little bit. And uh, three constellations, especially the two of them, Sagittarius, uh, Sagittarius will be in the sky and Scorpio will be in the sky. Really, really easy to find these objects and easy to see them uh, this time of year. Okay, that's a little bit about your night sky segment tonight. I'm going to just uh, uh, really quickly um, stop screen share. I guess I can do that. And then I'm going to turn the program over to Alex. Actually, I think uh, it'll go to Alicia for so she can Alicia talk about some first. current events. Sorry about that. That's all right. Alex and Alicia sound similar. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll before I start my section. And this poll says, would you go to space as a civilian astronaut? Yes or no? And there is a reason why I am asking. So I'm going to share my screen while you fill out that poll. And then I will, hopefully Alex will read those results for me in a little bit, but I'm going to talk about- I, 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 leave, I love the current events thing. I need to add music to the current event slide. What was that? We need to add music to current event slides. Oh, Take a note. Da, 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 da. <laughs> music, or some news music. I love it. Um, but just recently, we had history made here on Earth. So six, September 16th, SpaceX launched um, a Falcon 9 rocket. And this mission was called uh, Inspiration 4. And it was the first ever all private civilian uh, crew on a uh, on a mission. And so we are very excited at ASU because our very own alumni, uh, Professor Cyan Proctor was on board and she was actually the pilot. And so this is incredible. And we are so excited to um, just be involved <laughs> somehow with our alumni and learn about um, 
you know, this private event. And so this uh, mission did raise $200 million for the St. Jude's Children Children's Research Hospital, which is phenomenal. So although it was privately funded, they did raise a decent amount of money for charity. Um, and so uh, Cyan Proctor is actually an American geology professor, and she teaches at South Mountain Community College here in Phoenix. Uh, and so like I mentioned, she is an ASU alumni, and she still um, is very present on campus. I'm told that she does research with professors uh, often on, on campus. So we're very excited uh, to uh, see this happening and to uh, be making history. And so on the bottom, we have our very own director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, Dr. Minnie Wadwa. Um, and she was actually at the launch. Um, she was in, in Florida to watch the launch. They're very good friends. So we're excited to see it. Um, so, but that being, oops. You know, let, me, let me just add, so the picture that, go back and put it back on there. The picture there. So the family, so I, this didn't hit the news very much, but uh, family and friends of the four astronauts, citizen astronauts, were invited to go on those zero gravity flights. So while the astronauts were in orbit and flying around, um, uh, uh, many and uh, families and everybody sort of did these little sort of things where they take off in an airplane and then they drop it into this thing. And for several minutes, you can actually feel the effects of zero gravity so she's holding our cc flag and that just happened about a week or so ago so, so ah, excited i didn't for know her. that yeah, yeah so Very this is this is this is because of her friendship with science so so that's kind of typical sorry to interrupt uh and just with that poll uh would you go to space as a civilian most of us would 57 percent of us would go into space so i would too uh, and perhaps we can ask alex how he feels as he takes our last section which is resources you know I, I, if you would have asked me 10 years ago i probably would have said absolutely yes but you know um it's never been something that has really driven me i've never really been like wanted to go to an astronaut Probably, if I'm being honest, I would, just because the opportunity is <laughs> incredible. But it's never been something that, you know, I've really, really, really wanted to go to space. Um, but that's just because I'm a little bit biased. I like I like space being the images on my screen versus, you know. But let's talk about some of our resources that we have this week. A lot of them have been popping up in the chat for you guys, um, shared with you. But I'm just going to go over some of the few ones that uh, we haven't really got through and kind of remind you of some. The first one is our Interplanetary Initiative website. Um, there are a bunch of links on here, including you know projects, um, upcoming events, uh, the Interplanetary Lab, and then also uh, a link to subscribe to the newsletter. So check out the Interplanetary Initiative website, uh, interplanetary.asu.edu. Um, that's a great website to see. There have also been a lot of websites regarding the Technological Leadership Degree. Make sure to check that out. Um, some of the events to sign up for, including the Open Citizen Gathering and the Big Questions Teaming event. Um, both of those, the register links are in the chat. Um, this is a, an article from our former director and a big member of the Interplanetary Initiative, Lindy Elkin Stanton. We've been talking to her about a lot tonight. Um, this is a, a, an article that you know we really recommend reading. It's a great article. Um, time to say goodbye to our heroes. So look, at, look for that and look for that link. Um, we also have the Interplanetary Podcast. Um, here it is on Spotify, but you can find this wherever you get your po uh, podcast from. That includes Apple, iHeartRadio, Overcast, anything. Um, but make sure to look for this. This is a, a great um, podcast with um, the astronaut Katie Coleman, former astronaut Katie Coleman. So really neat podcast. Make sure to check that out too. And then, um, yeah, uh, make sure to just check out those links in the chat. And uh, if you want some more resources, uh, that's, that's your resources for the week. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. That's really great. So yeah, this is, uh, we, we don't uh, want to leave it just here with our hour long program every other week. There are ways that you can engage with us and find out more, dig a little deeper. And that's really the thing here is we're just trying to give you some ideas about how to engage the night sky, but also engage in some of the things that are going on in research and especially some of the stuff ASU has happening. So, so thank you very much. I'm going, we're running a little behind, but I want to invite you to come back in two weeks. I mentioned it in, a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Our guest guest is Dr. Everett Schock, uh, and he is a geology professor at ASU, has been with us uh, for many, many years. He is also uh, one of the investigators on a mission that is flying to the moon Europa of Jupiter. Europa is a very, very special place. You'll learn more about it in his 
this talk, uh, but it, uh, it is known to have liquid water under a very thick ice cap. And so we think the ingredients of those things that uh, are conducive for life exist on moons like Europa. There must be a heat source in there. There is liquid water. Uh, and so this is an investigation to do that. And he'll tell you what that means and how that works. And then I will also um, really just uh, give you some primer about how to find out about these moons, how to look at them yourself. Uh, just like Galileo did uh, 400 years ago. And uh, what that means, it's one of the easiest targets for amateur astronomers. And you don't need much equipment to make that happen. So we'll walk you through that and show you how to do that. It's about Europa and it's about the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Two weeks after that, something a little different. We're going to go all geology that week. Uh, this time, there is a, um, a special event called the International Shakeout. And it is about earthquakes. It's really about public awareness about earthquakes. And if you thought that Arizona doesn't have any earthquakes, you're going to have to come back in a month and we'll tell you that we do have earthquakes. And you'll meet a researcher, Dr. Ramon Aerosmith. He actually works uh, on, uh, on, on earthquakes. He is like the go-to guy when something big happens around the world. Usually the new teams are knocking on uh, um, Ramon's door to find out what happened. He does a lot of work and a lot of research in Central California, which of course is a popular place for earthquake people. And uh, so we'll learn more about his research and what they're doing and uh, how the earthquakes work and what it really means to Arizona because we're not um, we're not immune to earthquakes. They do happen here and they happen all the time. You'll find out more about that. So keep tuning in. Keep telling people about our program. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, sticking with us. Sorry, we're running a little bit behind tonight. But we have a lot to talk about. And uh, uh, keep, uh, keep going out and investigating on your own, asking those big questions. And uh, we will see you in two weeks. I really appreciate you going. And thanks to the team. And uh, we'll see you a little bit. Thank you.